So thank you for the introduction. In, in case it's boring for you, Titus Kuhn is the culprit. He invited me, and um, I have to say thank you to him. Uh, I have to confess that I founded companies which are not related to the treatment of uh, Theovenus Schanz, and uh, uh, I think uh, every meeting has a freak, and it could be me in that case dealing with brain only. Integral and Theovenus Schanz, uh, I will show you mimics. They are Schanz, but they, they are ir irrelevant. Uh, we'll, I will briefly touch vein of gale malformations and uh, AV, vein of gale and AV malformations. Granial dual fistulas and granial intracranial inter brain arteriovenous malformations, both plexiform and fistulas. So all these conditions have one thing in common. There are two things in common. There they is a shunt between arteries and veins. And this shunt and the uh, sequelae of the shunt may cause intracranial hemorrhage. The, the occlusion is relatively, technically speaking, it's relatively simple. You put either coils or glue or any other liquid embolic agent. The, the secret or the the trick is how you're going to do it, and I will show you one out of many tricks. So speaking about mimics, um, you see here that there is hyperemia in the brain, and if you go a little later in the angiogram, there is early filling of the vein. This is due to a transient middle cerebral artery occlusion. The patient came a little late. Uh, we did a thrombectomy. Now you see the MCA is patent. The patient nevertheless developed an MCA stroke middle cerebral artery partial stroke, and this is the reason for the development of this so-called post-ischemic hyperemia, or so-called previously called hyperperfusion. It's not really hyperperfusion, actually. It's, it's more or less a, a, a disturbance of the blood-brain barrier and uh, following phenomena. A d completely different uh, situation, this 11-year-old boy, he was referred to us with this intracerebral hemorrhage, and uh, the referring hospital had did an angiogram and, show, and had seen this um, early filling veins, also in the posterior circulation, early draining veins, and uh, this doesn't look like a brain AVM. This is certainly something different, and if you do an, uh, here's the, another vein, if you do an MR, you see there is a huge glial tumor, a malignant brain tumor, and the boy developed this angiogenesis within the tumor, and he had a hemorrhage inside the tumor. I mean, apart from everything else, dying from the hemorrhage would be much better than dying from the glioma. So let's go uh, f to the real uh, intracranial intervenous shunts, uh, vein of gale and malformations. The key feature of uh, vein of gale and malformations is that these kids have no vein of gale. Um, they have other uh, veins, but certainly no vein of gale, and the reduction of the shunt is the key um, in order to uh, correct the uh, volume overload for the heart. So this is the, this is the uh, uh, so-called uh, persistent median prostencephalic vein, which is replacing the vein of gale, and the key feature of these kids is they have no straight sinus. They have a felt sign sinus, as you may see here, Con congestive heart failure is the main issue in, in neonates. You have here a uh, brain artery, <clears throat> which is going to this huge sac. This is a varix of the uh, persisting median prosencephalic vein, and the drainage is through a falcine sinus, and there is no straight sinus. That's the key feature. Uh, persisting prosencephalic vein, falcine sinus, no straight sinus. The treatment is relatively simple. Yeah, you can either come from the transvenous side or from the transarterial side. You have to reduce the shunt. <clears throat> and uh, this is what is done in the uh, phase of ne for neonates, and the, the entire treatment can wait for a couple of years. This is the result. You see there's a significant reduction of the arteriovenous shunt, and that's it's just good enough for the first year. Completely different situation. This is not a vein of gale malformation. This kid has a straight sinus, no felt sign sinus, and this is the vein of gale, and this is an arteriovenous malformation at draining through the vein of gale and the straight sinus. As well as simple treatment, catheterizing the uh, supplying artery, closing off the, in, in kids it's mostly a, a direct fistula shunt between the supplying artery and the, supplying, and the draining vein, dual fistulas. We sometimes see children with dual fistulas, but by, but by definition they are not congenital, they are acquired. They could be acquired uh, during gestation or in, in intrauterine life, but they are not congenital lesions, they are acquired. 
um, that the symptoms are exclusively related to the veins. It may be prude, which is related to the high shunt volume, or ocular symptoms, I will show you a case in a, in a second, or they can cause cerebral hemorrhage, <clears throat> and as always, the interruption of the shunt, either from the arterial or from the venous side is the key um, purpose of the treatment. One of the most frequent uh, fistulas is at the cavernous sinus. These are uh, fistulas which are, again, quiet. They are behind the eyes, and uh, the drainage to the ocular veins are causing the symptoms. Ab about one-third of these fistulas are also using cerebral uh, veins for drainage, and these are the patients who start their career with ocular symptoms and end up with the intracranial hemorrhage. This is a very typical picture. You see here, this is the right external carotid artery, and through the skull base, you have an early opacification of the carotid sinus with cortical drainage. This is going up to the brain veins. Here you see it better from a lateral perspective. This is a cavernous sinus, and the, the drainage is over the uh, veins on the surface of the brain. This is a real emergency. These, these patients cannot wait. They should be treated as early as possible. The patients infrequently come with a primary hemorrhage. They mostly come with uh, ocular symptoms, ophthalmic symptoms like uh, ophthalm of, uh, exophthalmia, chemosis, and it could, can look like this, the swelling of the eyes like this, or here vessels injected in the sclera and CT or MR show as a typic, very typical sign the enlarged superior ophthalmic vein. That's a key feature of dual fistulas of the cavernous sinus. Going back to the same case, this is the internal carotid artery, and you see there are hundreds of small dural vessels coming from the internal carotid artery, having a pathological connection to the cavernous sinus and having early drainage over the cavernous sinus. This is the superior and this is the inferior ophthalmic vein, which is um, uh, relevant for the uh, ocular symptoms, the other side pretty much the same. And from these pictures, I think you can tell there's certainly no space for any arterial procedure. There are just too many vessels. It, it would be a never-ending story if you start occluding these arteries. There's only one solution. As a typical feature, these patients always have a thrombosis of uh, the axis sinus. If, if you want to go through the inferior petrosal sinus, you can be sure it's going to be thrombosed. What to do with the thrombosed uh, inferior petrosal sinus? You, take a brutal stiff wire, like a 35 terumo, you go up through the inferior petrosal sinus, a, a drill a hole into the petrosal sinus, catheterize the cavernous sinus, which is done here. You go uh, to the superior ophthalmic vein. Uh, you tell the hospital administration that this is gonna be very expensive, but it may uh, make the patient healthy and happy, and you include this with a couple of coils. Finished. Occipital dural um, AV fistulas, occipital, occipital dural AV fistulas are not occipital. They are at the cavernous sinus or at the sigmoid sinus. It's a clear misnomer. The treatment can be transarterial, it can be transvenous, but there's a very elegant technique. Um, you, this is the transverse and the sigmoid sinus. These are arteries coming through the bone and through the dura, supplying this artery. And the, the, the trick is, you take a huge balloon. This is a huge compliant balloon. It just follows the sinus. It's obliterating the sinus. Then you put a microcatheter into the middle meningeal artery and you inject onyx. And onyx is flow flowing like lava around the balloon, not obliterating the sinus and ob ob obliterating the, uh, the orifice where the artery is having, ha has contact to the sigmoid sinus like this. So you see the, the, the lava of onyx around this, the, the balloon here even better visible. The inflated balloon and all these onyx streaks around the balloon. Very elegant, very simple. Brain and venous malformations. Um, the patients usually present with an intracranial hemorrhage. The hemorrhage rate per year is about 4%. Fatality rate for the first hemorrhage is between 15 and 25%. And it's gonna be a long-lasting, a, a lifelong disorder if you have it. Um, and, uh, Roughly 40, 40 to 50% of AVM patients have at least one seizure during their lifetime. And the interruption of the tear venous shunt is the main goal of the treatment. The treatment is frequently quite complex. I, I will not go into this. I will show you how, how to deal with the shunt. The, if the, the shunt is, this is a little 
brain, surf superficial brain hemorrhage, and this is the shunt on the surface of the brain. I mean, there is no space for any endovascular procedure. This is so close to the uh, axis of the neurosurgeon, you just go uh, make a, a craniotomy and take the whole thing out. That's the shunt here. This is after surgery. No more shunt and certainly no space for endovascular treatment. This is a kit with a macrofascia, the opposite side. Th there is no space for uh, microsurgery. This is a very easy procedure. You go there with a the microcatheter, you fill the fistula with coils, and that's it. That's, a, a, I would say, a, a beginner's procedure. This is a, little more, this is a little more complex. This is a plexiform AVM of the thalamus, and you can imagine these are really dangerous vessels. They are supplying a terribly eloquent brain, and if you occlude all of them, the patient's probably bedridden for the rest of his life. So you be very careful. You occlude single arteries, and there's all, always a rest, a remnant that cannot be obliterated for the single, simple reason these arteries are too small. They are smaller than the, every existing microcatheter, and that's a, like this one. And that's the reason why these patients have a stereotactic angiography. This, this is the, the frame which is used for radiosurgery, targeted uh, irradiation that needs a com uh, combined work of the neuroradiologist and the, radi uh, the radiotherapist to define the target for radiation. These are arteries which are, cannot be embolized. This is supplying the brain and very little arteries going to the AVM, good for surgery. This is a huge cerebellar AVM and this is the reason for the, the hemorrhage, a small aneurysm in the nidus. You go with your catheter just in front of the aneurysm, to, uh, put a drop of glue and the aneurysm is gone and the patient has much less uh, risk of hemorrhage. To come to the last point, fistulous AVMs. They are uh, a technical challenge. This is a young woman with a, a small AVM, a big fistula and uh, hypoplastic veins. This is a catheter in front and this is the glue and the glue doesn't go to the vein. The, the, uh, the glue must not go to the vein. If you occlude the veins, the patient's gonna have a brain hemorrhage within the same hour. So what to do? You in induce asystole, and that's something I want to show you. It's a cool thing. Um, this is the brain AVM. Uh, the an angiography looks like that. Uh, so hopefully it works. That's the way it looks. It's uh, chaotic vessels in the occipital lobe. And then comes the asystole. It, for the first, if you do it for the first time, I think it's good to make a weak and course in psychology in order to get uh, uh, in harmony with your anesthesiologist. They are always freaking out. And this is just before the asystole. Now you see the monitor, you inject 30, six milligram of, under the protest of the anesthesiologist, you inject 36 milligram of adenosine, you have asystole, and if you observe the glue, the glue doesn't go to the vein. The, the glue stays where you inject it. it there is no flow. You have instantaneous uh, circular still stint in the brain for roughly, with 36 milligrams, for roughly 20 seconds. Heart comes back, but the, the brain circulation needs a little longer to recover. It, it takes a longer second to come. You have enough time to inject your glue without going to the veins. It's, it's very elegant, it's low cost, it's instantaneous. The only thing is the anesthesiologist, which is always freaking out. Thank you. <laughs>